Hello everybody and welcome to the latest Sea to City webinar with Nautilus International and Maritime London. Sea to City is a mentoring program that all full members of Nautilus International can take part in and it seeks to pair our members that is serving seafarers with maritime professionals who are working in the maritime services sector in the city of London. You can find out more from our website, which is nautilusint.org, that's nautilusint.org, or you can follow the link that is going to be pasted in the chat of this webinar shortly. So, in today's webinar, we will be speaking with Tim House, who is Vice President, Industry Liaison at P&I Club Guard. Tim is a former seafarer who has worked on tankers, coasters, bulk vessels and container ships and who says for him going to sea wasn't planned but coming ashore was. So Tim, welcome very much to the webinar. Good morning Helen, thanks very much, it's great to be here. Fabulous. Well, thank you again for joining us. I thought perhaps we could start there with that quote that I just mentioned in the introduction, that for you going to sea wasn't planned, but coming ashore was. Perhaps you could describe for us your own career journey, given that context, from those unplanned days to where you are now as vice president of one of the biggest P&I clubs in the world. Thanks, Helen. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a strange one because you're sort of um, you, 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 I think when I, when I went to sea, I was 16 and, um, at that age, I, I mean, I applied to go to sea when I was, I suppose, 15 and a half. And you have a, you have a very, very sort of limited understanding of where, where you might end up in life and what, 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 what you really want to do. So I was very much led by my, uh, my dad who had been in, um, shipbuilding, um, okay. his career. And we had we had through that through shipping if you like and shipbuilding we had lived overseas and um i was at the time in in england uh in, in school and he he just sort of came home one afternoon and said here's a here's an application form to become a a cadet uh, and i i didn't really know what that was and so like, sure. any, <laughs> like any any 15 year old you just do what your parents tell you and i filled out the form and signed it and sent it off and and that, that was really the uh, the beginning of it and um I, I then eventually got a, a cadet ship with um, uh, Lloyd's, uh, Lloyd's of London, as it was then known, which is now mm -hmm. Maritime London Officer Cadet Scheme. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I went off to sea as a, as a dual cadet. Um, uh, so that meant that I was doing engineering as well as, as deck. Yes. And because Lloyd's, Lloyd's of London didn't have ships of their own, we went with the training managers uh, called Chilton Maritime. Yes. And they, they also looked after the BP cadets. So we went on BP ships. Uh, and then any, anybody else who would have us. So that was P&O uh, and uh, on, on coasters and with Furnace Willie. Um, and, and so I had quite a different range of ships as a cadet. Um, and then I, I qualified as a, a navigating officer and engineer. And I, uh, I think going back to your original point, at that point, then I'd been four years at sea and I thought, mm. gosh, it's quite hard being on a, on a tanker. You're away for four months. You know, and I was only 20. All yep. my friends had gone to A-levels and were starting university. And I sort of thought, maybe I want to come ashore actually and that's when I sort of looked around and realized that that you, you, you to some extent you have to you have to stay uh, for a sufficient period of time to get uh, to get the knowledge that that would then enable you to um to get it to get the job that you think you want when you do come ashore yes. so it was my heart I was a bit torn then because I, I wanted to be with you know normal people ashore if you like yes but I, but I stuck it out um and I wanted to, to learn a bit more about navigation so in fact I in, in, I was at sea for 10 years and in the last two or three years I was on uh, cruise ships which okay. gave me a lot more experience in terms of if you like precision navigation um, and also then it gave me a bit more of a, a balance in terms of you know having a bit of a social life and, and seeing nice places and stuff like that. Yes yeah it's a little bit it can be a little bit more social can't it so what rank did you get to in uh, your sea-based career? I was navigator first officer and okay. then before I left, I, I got my master's ticket. I didn't, I, so when I, when I got, when I finished my cadetship, I, I, I didn't progress with the um, engineering. So I, I hmm. still had my, I think it was class four engineering and then I had class three deck, but I then focused on deck and right. then rose up the ranks on, on, uh, on the deck side. But I didn't, I didn't say in command, but I got that piece of paper, the master's ticket. Um, and I was then recruited by Holman, Fennick and Willen, as they were then called now, HFW, a law mm -hmm. firm, and as one of their casualty investigators. So they they needed, um, they're, I mean, they're quite a big law firm now at the time, they were a bit smaller, but they then had 
shipping lawyers who would give advice on charter parties and also then when um, when casualties happened uh, they would give advice to the insurers and the owners and so they needed people with maritime experience to go on board and, and for example take the statements and kind of figure out what had happened in that accident right so they, needed, they needed mariners and so they recruited me as one of their casualty investigators and then after I'd started after a short while they said would you like to qualify as a, a solicitor hmm. uh, and, and I, I did want that because I didn't want to be sort of um, I wanted the ability to progress outside of the box, if you like. So I felt that, well, I, you know, I've got a mariner's qualification. That's something that has got me a good job. But I also want to be able to move within this sort of shore based environment a bit, a bit more freely. So I thought it'd be a good idea to qualify as a, as a solicitor. And so I embarked on that, which was mm. quite hard because I was working at the same time. Um, yes. And so I was studying in the evenings and doing weekends and things like that. And I, I, I did, I think, two or two or three years part time. Uh, studies and then I, I sort of had a deal with them where they said we'd like you to go out to Singapore because we need a mariner out in Singapore a mariner lawyer and I said okay well I'll, I'll go out to Singapore but uh, uh, if you allow me to go full-time for the last bit of my law stuff uh, so I went uh, for nine months uh, to Nottingham where I did my LPC and that, and that was great because I was then you know quite experienced I'd already had a career and I was working for a, a city law firm already uh, and I was in the mix then with lots of people that were just just studying law uh, mm. and we had a lot to share and it was good fun and I kind of caught up on the bit of, if you like the university life that I'd missed out on that you'd missed out on absolutely absolutely and I know that's not the end of the story just yet because we haven't got up to how you've come to guard but I thought I could kind of unpick that slightly two things there that you just mentioned one was that you got approached by AF HFW excuse me for the role for our members for our viewers listening today what does that mean you got approached did you have a pre-existing relationship with them were you headhunted how did that come about well I think that's 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 one of the things that um is maybe difficult to understand when you're out. So when, when you're still at sea, is, is the mm. ability to. And I was helped because I had a, I had a dad who was who was working in shipping, and so I said you need to go and talk to this person, or you need to yes. build a relationship with these people so that they know who you are, because otherwise you're just a mariner. So when I was when I was uh, even when I was a cadet and when I was a junior officer, I was doing work experience. I I, I managed to get in touch with some people who worked in city law firms. So I was with uh, I got in touch with a. A gentleman called Tony Vlasto, who, who was then head of shipping at Clifford Chance when Clifford Chance had a shipping department. Mm. Um, and I'm still in touch with Tony these days, very much so. Mm. And uh, he, he allowed me to come and do a week's work experience here and there when I was on leave. And that then sort of got me into knowing a few people. Yes. Um, and through that, um, I then got in contact with people at Clifford Chance. But actually, uh, but actually the, the, the sort of the curious thing with HFW is it was one of the mariners in HFW who was on a cruise with his wife. And said, "Can I come up to the bridge and do a bridge visit?" Which I don't know if you're allowed to do those now, but, but then we were allowed to. So I gave him, you know, thinking this this would be good. I gave him a really really good <laughs> visit of the bridge with his wife. Yes, and he said, yes. He said, "Look, we're looking for young mariners. Why don't you come into the office when when you're um, on shore next?" And I went in on a Friday. I met with him. He introduced me to the who was then the, the head of uh, the, the the shipping department, the Admiralty department, and they actually believe it or not, they actually called me the next day on a Saturday. Wow. And said, would you like to come and work for us when you finished your your ticket? And I was yes. then due to get my master's ticket. I don't know six months later. Yes. So how it worked. So it was it was kind of being open and willing to talk to people, remembering, you know, somebody that might be a good contact to keep, and and, and developing it that way. Absolutely. I mean, that sounds like two different things to me. One, you know, taking advantage of an opportunity that presents itself, you know, and, and giving that person the, the grand tour of, of um, the ship, as, as you described. But then also um, being quite proactive in trying to get additional um, experience within your career that you wouldn't necessarily get just by working at sea. So seeking that work experience, you know, with a, with a law firm. So, yeah, that's that's two really good tips for members. Thank you very much. So. Um, I did interrupt you. Do you want to tell us how you came to work with Guard, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll speed it up because I'm conscious that we we, we could talk no about problem. this. No so, problem. No so, uh, problem. So I, I then worked with um, HFW. Uh, so I was 26 when I started with them. I okay. qualified as a lawyer when I was uh, 30 and then I moved uh, I about six months in Hong Kong. And then I moved to Singapore for a few years and then I moved to Greece, uh, all doing the same role, casualty investigation, but also developing as a lawyer. When I was then in Greece, um, I was headhunted to, to join um, a Greek owner uh, as, as their head of insurance and, if you like, head of legal. 
uh, and they were a listed company and I spent a couple of years with them at the time the market was coming down down the slope rather rapidly so that involved right. restructuring and chapter 11 and all sorts of stuff so I learned a huge amount but it was it's quite a stressful job but very interesting yes, yes. At that stage I've been overseas for seven or eight years so I decided I want to come home so I then got in touch with some of my former colleagues who had been at uh, HFW who had started up uh, their own firm, Campbell Johnson Clark, uh, which uh, which is uh, still a successful firm today, uh, and they invited me to to join them in London. Uh, so instead of going back to HFW, I went to to join them, uh, and then they made me a partner after six months or something, and I was with them for five years. Um, and then uh, so I've done sort of a total of about fifteen years as a lawyer then, and ten years as a mariner, so twenty five years, and then. Uh, and then uh, the opportunity with Guard came up, uh, which was with a, a firm of recruiters. And, and I thought that 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 pulled everything together in my sense. So for, I had the Mariners experience for 10 years and then I had overseas experience. And I also had sort of 15 years as a lawyer, plus a little within that 15 years, a couple of years as a head of legal for um, a big listed uh, Greek owner. And I thought, um, you know, I can really pull all that together uh, into into a job that that is essentially broad policy and relationship management. So my role with Guard is to focus on is primarily to 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 help uh, to manage their role or their their sorry their relationship with the other with the other PNI clubs, twelve others within the IG, um, and also the IG secretariat. So together, the international group of PNI clubs, and that's one of the most important relationships for Guard. Uh, and so I help I help with that, and I thought this is this is a good launch pad, mm. uh, bearing in mind my experience because uh, it's quite broad, uh, and I think it's it's great. I absolutely love it. I get to use all of the stuff that I've learned, the mariner bit, the lawyer bit, the in-house bit um, to to ultimately try to do good. And that's what that's what I try to do. Which is what I'd really like to come to now. But just before I do, I just want to remind uh, or let our viewers know that you can ask direct questions of Tim, uh, which I'll put to him at the end of the webinar. If you just find the Q&A box uh, up to the right of your screens, put your question in there and I'll uh, find some time at the end of the questions to get your points to him. So Tim, back to you. We've just described your kind of career trajectory so far, and I would describe you as a seafarer turned lawyer turned insurer. You now work for Guard, which, as we've said, is one of the largest P&I clubs in the world. But there might be many of our members on this webinar who don't really know what a P&I club is or perhaps don't really fully understand what it does. Could you perhaps uh, describe the business for us and how it can touch upon seafarers' working conditions or their own experiences? Yeah, happily. Um, I mean, I, if I remember when I was at sea, we we knew of P and I Club because that yeah. was referred to, and often when we arrived in port, the P and I Club correspondent would come on board, or if there was, usually it would be the captain that would speak to them. And this is right. not on the cruise ships; this is on the cargo ships. We saw you saw more of the sort of P and I clubs on the cargo ships because we were carrying cargo and there were bills of lading and things like that. Um, so it's something that you're aware of, but in, in essence, what a club is for historic reasons, um, ship owners, I'm going back, you know, several hundred years in, 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 in many senses, ship owners could buy insurance for the value of their ship and the value of the cargo because mm -hmm. they were quantified. You knew what it would cost to get a new ship and you knew what it would cost to, um, replace a cargo if it was lost, but, uh, the, the, they couldn't get insurance for the unquantifiable bit, which would, which would be what happens if or the seafarers uh, were lost at sea, mm. or if the cargo uh, spilled uh, on a coastline, uh, so they, uh, or if there was a collision, because you don't know what, what, what you would hit and how valuable it be and what you would be held liable to pay, or if you've got a big fine. So they needed insurance for these unquantifiable liabilities. So that, that's really the origins of a P&I club, is the need for that insurance. And, and it began in very simple steps, but by owners getting together and say, well, these could be really big claims, so we'll, we'll, mm. we'll we'll form a little club amongst us and we'll share those claims. If one of us gets hit with a big one, we'll mm. all put our hands in our pockets. So that was the concept of pooling and it's moved on from there. N now, obviously, p &I clubs, well, within the IG, uh, the, the, the IG system, um, which is 13 clubs, ensures roughly 90 to 95% of worldwide shipping for p &I liabilities, those unquantifiable ones. And it's it, it's no longer a sort of a whip round system if there is a, a big claim. Right. If there's contribute in advance, each of the clubs has free reserves. And then over a certain limit of claim, the, the, the club will initially pay that claim itself, and then it will share just amongst the clubs. And then if it's a very large claim, they then have a reinsurance system in place, which is collectively purchased by all of those clubs. Yes. And, and then that reinsurance will respond to the, for the very biggest losses. Yes. So it's a sophisticated system now. And the clubs have grown in sophistication as well. Mm. Some of them are still monoline, where they just do the P&I aspect. 
Guard has, has diversified. So we, we, we do hollow machinery insurance, we do offshore energy, builders risk, wind farms, all a uh, loss of hire, uh, defense cover, but everything's related to uh, the, the, the core business, which is the PI aspect. And, and if we diversify into other things, what we can do is we hope to make to make money on those uh, other activities so that we can then bring that into the central pot and then effectively subsidize the, the underlying cost of insurance for the ship owners. So it, it's all there to serve them. That's so really that's interesting. Club, that's what a club is. So it's quite a sophisticated beast now compared to what it was in the, in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So I think um, some of our audience who uh, who have had perhaps minimal experience with P&I clubs in the past, they might be quite cynical about, you know, uh, they perhaps might be seeking to benefit the ship owners, which of course you are, because, you know, they're the members that they who have set up the mutual system, as it were. But how can clubs actually benefit seafarers as well? Is there ways that P&I clubs can help support seafarers alongside the ship owners? Yeah, absolutely. And and the origins of the, the clubs is is effectively to serve the ship owners' needs. Yeah. That's how it began. And the ship owners, they need seafarers. Um and and uh, you know, I want I want to be as clear as possible that the, the seafarers are front and center for the clubs. Uh, and, and the main reason for that is is that it helps with loss prevention. So if you have a happy crew, uh, and a well-educated crew and properly rested crew uh, that have got uh, the right frame of mind. Uh, and they're properly trained, then they will look after that ship and you're less likely to have an accident. And that serves the collective needs of those ship owners because if all the ship owners are encountering accidents, the, the P&I clubs, are, the, the funds are going to be depleted quickly and it will then cost more. So it is in, it is in the P&I club's interest on behalf of the collective membership to ensure that there are no losses or, mm. or losses are minimized. Mm. And, and one of the main reasons, or sorry, one of the main focus areas is the seafarers for those reasons. So uh, we we care enormously about the welfare of seafarers and and when seafarers are in difficulty we 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 have uh, you know a moral obligation to step in and help whenever we can um and i would say you know going to the sort of the comment about that we're just looking after the ship owners i i know of in my experience which is is now 30 years i know of very 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 few cases where there has been a line between the ship owners and the seafarers in other words where the club sort of steps over and says no no we'll support the ship owner but we're not supporting the seafarer and that might be in cases where there's been, you know, where there's been drug smuggling and things like that, where the ship owners didn't know about it, but the seafarers were involved in that. And when you when you go into criminal activity like that, well, then you sort of step out of, you know, you're on the wrong side of the line. But but it's very rare for that to happen. So, mm. so we're, we're, we're there to protect, you know, the, the owners, but also can, the seafarers. Can you describe to me perhaps some of the ways that you do support those seafarers? Do you have any particular programs, for example, or how is that kind of built into the structure of the service that Guard can provide? Well, we have a, we have a very an excellent and, and quite large loss prevention department, which focuses very much on seafarers. Hmm. At the moment, it's focusing significantly on uh, uh, mental health for seafarers because that's not a new subject. Uh, and we, you can trace mental health back to a lot of the accidents that do happen, but it's come very much to the spotlight because of COVID. Mm. Um, and it's it's tragic that, that what, what unfolded during COVID and the injustice that happened in, all over the world because countries essentially they 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 they, they took a nationalistic view and the seafarers yeah. have left in the middle. And that's been that's been really challenging. Uh, so we worked very hard uh, joining a, a COVID task force during um during uh, uh, the COVID pandemic and we we worked hard to find uh, to, to to get the the, sea, the the key worker status for the seafarers so yes. that's the type of thing there's a lot of lobbying that goes on in the background that the clubs are involved in mm -hmm. doing individually and through the IG on a more direct basis we've recently um and I I did send um uh, a link to this we've recently uh with the help of a hospital in, in Norway developed an app which is the Mariner's Medico guide which you can it's free of charge it's for the world at large and it's aimed specifically for seafarers they can download it onto their telephone and it will it's like a ship captain's medical guide but it's on your phone you can put in the symptoms in the search box it will throw up the results of what the what the problem might be and it will then give you first aid advice uh, and then connect you to telemedical advice and things like that. So it's nice. this kind of thing is bang on in terms of making sure the seafarers are looked after. Okay, that's really interesting. I can see some questions are coming through on our, our Q&A chat here. So I, I know that people are, are making good use of that. But just before we go over to some of those really good questions that our audience are uh, asking, I've got a couple more for you, Tim. So we hear that P&I clubs are keen on hiring people with seafaring experience. Is that actually true? And what sorts of skills are P&I clubs looking for? 
I think if you look at a uh, good question, if, if you look at what this, what the P&I clubs do, primarily they ensure uh, for collisions, um, pollution, um, loss of life, um, and uh, uh, the, the, the liabilities that arise in connection with operating a ship. And if you look at those types of things, you need several sets of skills. You need the underwriter to, to, to be able to price that product correctly. Uh, you need the claims handlers that can then respond to the claims. And you also need technical people that can understand what has happened so that they can explain that to the claims handlers. And they can also then feed back to the underwriters, uh, you know, from a, from a technical perspective, what all of this means. So when you when you when you look at what the needs of the seafarers are, they, they relate to the insurance that the, that the that the clubs provide, and that will evolve with time. As we you know, you know, as, as I've said, Guard is now doing offshore wind and things like that. Mm -hmm. We do hull and machinery. We do builders risk. So we need expertise in those areas mm -hmm. as we move forward. Autonomous vessels will 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 gain prominence, and so we'll need more experience in terms of data technology and uh, autonomy systems because we don't have those skills now. So there is very much a need for technical. Uh, yes. input within a club to understand and to be able to do our job as a club. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. I think I will go over to some audience questions here. We've got a really interesting one here from Stephen Gudgeon. Hi, Stephen. Nice to hear from you. So uh, he says, interesting you mentioned rested crews. Can P&I clubs put pressure on ship owners, etc.? Um, probably charterers, I imagine, is the that etc. There to have more realistic, uh, safe manning certification more realistic safe manning mm. certification um i think the uh, and this 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 comes to some extent into the role of the clubs uh bearing in mind that we stand behind the ship owners what we expect from uh, an enter ship owner is that they have uh they're complying with the law and they have a ship that is class uh, classed and classes maintained so in other words you okay. have a ship that is physically uh robust enough to encounter the perils of the voyage mm. and you have a ship that is in compliance with the law Mm -hmm. And it's difficult for us to go beyond that and, and say to a ship owner, you must do more than is required by the law, uh, because that's generally not the way things are done. So assuming that the, the, the ship is sound and the, the law is being applied with, then, you know, invariably we take a, a bit of a hands off approach because our role is one to support. Having said that, if there are if there are examples of activities within the law, but where we see there is benefit in, in, in improving certain procedures and, and making sure that seafarers are you know, more rested uh, than the law requires because we've seen accidents arising in that context, then we would we would work on that within our loss prevention context. So that, and we, we do a lot of publications, we do videos, um, we work with the ship owners directly by doing uh, crisis drills with them. And we work an awful lot on topics that are of particular importance to the industry. And fatigue is, is a recurring uh, theme. But I, I would say that it's, you know, we've done a lot as an industry to tackle it. If you go back 20 years, fatigue was a real problem. Now it's less of a problem than it used to be, but we're looking at mental health, more, more, more focus on that now, and perhaps the two are interlinked. So we try and do as much as we can, but we can't force uh, the ship owners to do more than what is required uh, by law. Mm. Absolutely. Well, that is something that Nautilus has been camping on, campaigning on for quite a long time. And we obviously would like to see changes in that law, in that regulation to lift the minimum manning levels. But uh, we appreciate the to change international law is a long and slow process. So just to reassure members that we will continue to campaign on this issue um, on their behalf. But um, I'll move on to another question here. It's a question from Colin Leggett. Hi, Colin. Thanks for joining us today. He asks, how much importance in place on the type of ships that you've served on and time spent at sea and rank does time served come second to rank obtained what a good question mm, interesting one yeah. um, I that would probably be a, a dynamic situation when I when I when I uh, qualified which was in 1996 there was a there was a huge sort of shortage I mean there still is a shortage but there was a vast amount of opportunities I had six or seven job offers um, and, wow. and yeah, and then you were you were going through the ranks fast. I thought it was because I was brilliant. If I look back, <laughs> <laughs> if I look back, um, I, I think it was more more a case that there was they were pushing people through the ranks because there was simply a shortage of, of people. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's probably a time served. Uh, I mean, there's, there'll be an element of it, which is the quality of that time served. If you have been on a ship that has been alongside for three years, then you come ashore and say you've got three years experience. Hmm. When you sort of scratch the surface, you'll realise that that was three years experience ashore. If yeah. you've got experience on offshore uh, vessels going to and from rigs uh, and in very difficult con conditions, or you've been on ferries and then going in and out of port, 
twice a day, you're going to have a lot more experience than someone who's been deep sea. But there's a role for the deep sea stuff as well. So I think, it, you know, the, the, before you come ashore, I think you've got to demonstrate that you've got a pretty decent level of experience. And in order that you have the credibility that's necessary for people to, to say, oh, let's ask him about that because he's likely to know. And that's yeah. the bit sort of needed ashore, if you see what I mean. So I do. You can't, you can't really sort of skip it. You can't sort of uh, cut a corner, unfortunately. For those that do want to come ashore, you, you, I think you've got to, you've got to, you've got to do a decent run at sea to be treated as a, an ex seafarer, if you see what I mean. Yes, I do, I do, I do, and I've got a kind of slightly um, tricky question now, but it, it is related to this conversation because um, it's uh, coming from John Alex, and John wants to know: Is there an age limit to coming ashore? Which is it's I think it's a pertinent question you know if you've been at sea for 40 years you're in your you know is there an upper limit and is there a lower limit as well well um I think uh without obviously going against yeah. legal you know yeah. I, I want to put this out there we're not no. going to be saying anything illegal right now or going no, against no, regulations no. of course yeah that's that's a good point Helen I mean I think that you know if you've if you've spent 30 or 40 years at sea um, you are going to be hugely experienced um, and you will have an awful lot to contribute ashore. Um, you will also have probably served at quite a high rank uh, mm. within the, within, uh, on ships. Um, and if you then do come ashore, there might be a little bit of friction on where you should fit in to the shoreside um, organisation because you, 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 you've been up there at sea. Yeah. And you might think, okay, well, the knowledge that you've got, we actually want that to be there, um, not there. Um, so there, there can sometimes be a sort of where you've got to sort of, I don't know, um, come down a couple of notches in order to work your way up. Mm. Um, whereas if you've been at sea for, I mean, I, you know, I, I was only at sea for 10 years and, and I was 26. So it was, it was not really a problem for me to come in at what I, what, what they probably felt was quite a junior level. For me, it was, oh, this is great. Um, there was no problem there. There was no friction. So I think that so long as you've got sort of awareness there, mm. um, uh, the, 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 there shouldn't be a problem. Um, and of course, the more, more more time you've been at sea, the more experienced you'll be, and that's that's worth a lot. Um, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Got I've got one question here um, from where's where's it gone now? It's uh, Ernesto Duhart. I hope I pronounced your name right, Ernesto. Apologies if I haven't. He asks, where would one go about looking for these type of job openings, assuming that one has no contacts ashore? Which I imagine quite a few seafarers feel like they don't have those contacts yeah. ashore. Now, Ernesto, I have to give a little bit of a plug for the Sea to City mentoring scheme here. Obviously, this is why the whole program is set up. It's to put our members in contact with shore-based professionals who can help guide you through that journey. Um, but uh, from your point of view, Tim, what advice would you give to Ernesto? So you've got no, you're a cold caller essentially. Where, yes. would, you, where would you look? Um, yes. Well, I think I think um, the, the, there are websites where there are shore-based jobs uh, for superintendents, uh, for surveyors, for claims handlers, for underwriters, um, and all, all the things that sort of operate in the city. Uh, I, off the top of my head, I can think of one which is Spinnaker, um, and, and but I know that there are others. I, I couldn't list them all for you. There is, uh, which I will mention, the Maritime London Officer Cadet Scheme. I'm one of the trustees of that, which was the sort of reincarnated version of the, the Lloyds of London Cadet uh, uh, Scholarship Scheme. They have a, a LinkedIn page, um, which which is supposed to be a forum for people to to, to share views on these sorts of things and it's a bit like your mentoring thing so I can maybe send the link to that afterwards uh, as well Helen but yes. uh, you, you can you can to some extent you could you know you could spend some time you would do well to spend some time uh, going to functions or going to presentations going to seminars and things like that where you'll meet people after the seminar so if there's something you're interested in register for a seminar it's, it's useful to do it in person then you can meet people afterwards ask questions, ask questions that's absolutely right and I do know that Maritime London holds a number of free uh, seminars and webinars as well similar to this one so there are lots of ways that seafarers can start to get involved in the industry the shore-based industry if they haven't done so before um, I'm going to be very cheeky and I'm going to ask one more question I know we're bang up on time but this is it's uh, quite a few people are asking similar type questions they're asking about what type type of um, retraining or qualifications they might seek to get to put themselves in a good position to join a PNI club? Um, retraining and qualification. Mm. I mean, if you, if you are a mariner, then you have something to bring to the table. 
Uh, I mean, there's lots of mariners that want to come ashore. So just because you're a mariner doesn't guarantee you the job. You're in the same place as anybody else looking for a job. There's competition. But you have something to offer with that. If you're trying to get an edge, then you could look at the other things that, that if you want a PNI club or the insurance sector generally would be the same. The other things that they might use, they might want sort of um, uh, some economics qualification or some business or administration qualification or shipping law. You know, we're looking at also things, look at the future. LNG ships are suddenly very popular. Autonomous vessels will come in. Offshore wind is going to be vast uh, thanks to, you know, well, not thanks to, but because of the conflict and, and energy security, people are looking at alternative renewable sources of energy. So look at the renewable sector. Absolutely. Got experience, and we're looking at renewables because we all need to decarbonize. So there are areas there that you can find where you can add value. Uh, you don't have to look at what people have done. Don't look at what I've done necessarily, because that was good you know, 30 years ago. <laughs> look for the next 30 years, perhaps. Yeah, no, absolutely. And as we know, our government, as many others, are inv investing uh, in alternative um, energy for the future. So I think that's really good advice there. Thank you very much, Tim. And just before I, I do wrap up the webinar today, I also wanted to say that you could consider, if you are a full member of Nautilus, you could consider standing for the Nautilus Council. This is the group of people who help oversee the running of the, the union. It's uh, consisting of Nautilus officials and other serving seafarers and it's a really good way to start to make those contacts um, in the shore-based career and also to help your union to support other members. So consider standing for Nautilus Council if you're interested in that type of thing. But thank you, Tim, so much for joining us today. So much really good information there. Such an interesting, varied career that you have had. Um, we will email people a follow-up after this. Um, and of course, people can also uh, watch on Catch Up if they want to uh, refresh themselves on the conversation in future. So um, thank you again. And uh, we will have another webinar in about a month's time. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Tim. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.